Hello everyone and welcome to another video with me 320 Simpilot and today we're taking a look at the brand new ATR for Microsoft Flight Simulator. This add-on is available on the Microsoft Flight Simulator Marketplace and it is made by Asobo and Hans Hartmann. It is branded as an expert series aircraft for Microsoft Flight Simulator and it's of a really interesting aeroplane which we have not yet seen on this channel so I'm very excited to give it a try. In today's video, I'm going to take you through a full flight. We'll look at how we set up the aircraft, uh, we'll use the in built in checklists, uh, and we're also going to have a look at some of the more obscure systems of the ATR. It's a very interesting aeroplane. We're then going to fly it from here in Southampton down to Guernsey, and I'll give you my impressions of the aircraft and uh, what I think of it as an add on and also as an aeroplane for uh, our use in Microsoft Flight Simulator. I am a real world Airbus pilot, but I have also flown a turboprop aircraft. I flew uh, professionally the competitor to the ATR. I flew the Dash 8 Q400. So it's really, really um, appealed to me to give a, a spin in what is was seen as the competitor. Uh, we would park up next to ATRs often because, of course, it serviced similar airports. So I, uh, I'm really interested to give it a go and see what, what sort of things are different about it, what I like more and less than the, the Dash 8 as a, as a comparison. Some obvious things about the ATR compared to the Dash 8 Q400 would be that it is slightly less powerful engines. It's got a strange design in the sense of where the doors are uh, and it doesn't have an APU. So all these little details to it that make it an interesting aircraft to operate. And I think quite a different one if you're trying to uh, simulate at home. It would give you a few, a few sort of head scratches as you try and work out exactly what it needs to be done to operate this aircraft. Which makes it a good bit of fun and a worthy aircraft to see in a simulator. I am a real world airline pilot, but none of this is for any real world use, of course. It's just to give you some extra context in your home simulations. Right, let's get started. So in this package, you get the ATR42 and the ATR72-600 variant of both. That's the most recent version. So we get the nicest glass cockpit. They run with slightly modified engines that are a bit more efficient. So overall, the, the most uh, complete version of the ATR. And I think that's a good choice, a nice one for us to have and makes it a, a, a comparatively straightforward or a flight deck that we might recognize uh, more than some of the older ATR flight decks, which are a bit more dial based keeps it as a modern aircraft, which is, of course, it is. It is uh, still a very popular transport aircraft. ATR is a joint French and Italian company, but the uh, French side of that is effectively Airbus, so it has strong connections to the Airbus aircraft, and you can see that throughout as we're going to find out as we go into the flight deck, which is another thing I find really curious as I compare it between my Airbus and uh, Dash 8 experience. Uh, the 42, the ATR 42 original version, not the 600, but the old version, made and back in 1984. So it's been around a long time. And the 72, which we have here, is a stretched version that first uh, was delivered in 1989. This 600 variant was released in 2007. Um, and like I say, with the the more efficient glass cockpit. So it's a relatively old design now. Um, it's uh, yeah, it, it's been going around a while, even this 600 variant. But it's a uh, yeah, rather, rather interesting machine. It is uh, part of the Expert series, as I say. So this is an add-on from a Sobo, but it is more detailed than we've seen in their previous releases made by Hans Hartmann as well. Um, and it's selling for £16.74 or $19.99 or euros. Uh, and you get a 30% discount if you have the Deluxe or Premium version of Microsoft Flight Simulator. So that put this aircraft down in sort of the £12 region for me, which I actually I can't help but say is a, an excellent price. Uh, and I will go through the, the video today and explain why I think that is. But uh, yeah, it's it's you can just see from the model here, it's very good. Only comes with a couple of liveries, but of course, we're already seeing many, many freeware liveries appear. Now, I can't do a walk around on the ATR because I just don't know what I'm looking at. But just to show you some of the details we get, uh, you've got the static ports here all labeled and with nice decals written clearly. And this is a very similar format to the Airbus um, statics and that's going to be a theme of this aircraft is how how much relates to the airbus uh, you've got the radome and then the electronic uh, static diffusers you've got the uh, pitot probe and then you can just come down to landing gear just to see how how nice the modeling is on this aircraft i'm i'm really very pleased with it quite a clean airplane there's no doubt about that but uh, still perfectly perfectly reasonable for a nice newly delivered atr uh, yeah you've got the gear doors and connections and the, the nose lights down here as you move down the fuselage look at this you've got the external ground connectors the antennas again very clean but i i don't find it particularly lacking i think it's quite nice the lighting's good we'll see that later on although a few bugs i think still sitting in the lighting system uh, particularly on the interior but for now uh, serviceable certainly you've got this uh, ice shield which is a unique sort of turboprop thing which is to protect the fuselage from ice that flies off the propeller blades 
Propeller blades are heated on the uh, inner part, which spins slower. The outer part doesn't need it because it spins so fast the ice shouldn't stick. But the problem is ice that does form can break off as it builds up, as it gets too heavy, so it breaks off the propeller. And that's going to break off and fly into the fuselage. So this shield protects the fuselage from dents from that. Uh, the windows are obviously considered strong enough, I guess. <laughs> um, you've got the cut here in emergency uh, signage. This is to give you an idea of where if you were a fire service you could cut into the airplane without cutting a fuel line or a pressurized hydraulic line or something like that. The landing gear on the ATR is something that us dash pilots were always very jealous of. It's similar to the BAE 146 in that it's what we call trading link. This means that its axis is in front of it as opposed to just sort of compressing on an oleo. It actually bends backwards and up which makes it very good at absorbing rougher landings so that they tend to be aircraft that you can land very nicely. Quite an interesting gear door design. The gear folds up and in, and then this other little door folds down on top of the hinge mechanism. Quite interesting to see. Modeled nicely here as well. Again, look at the look at the uh, yeah all the pipes and everything. Really nice. Again, can't comment on it too much as I haven't seen up close the ATR's uh, gear, but that's pretty good going. The boots um, are these black parts. They're called the boots, which is the icing boots. These are inflated to break off ice that builds up on the front of the airplane. Nicely modeled. And there's no doubt about the silhouette of this aircraft. Definitely captured the ATR just right. I think it's very nice. Out here we have the more modern style strobe lights and nav lights, which will power up shortly. But hopefully this is just giving you an impression overall of what the, the, the detail of this model is. Like I say, it's not the best texturing we have ever seen in an add-on for a Microsoft Flight Simulator, but I still think it's a perfectly, perfectly reasonable model um, in many ways. Well, it certainly is to me anyway. It's just an opinion. You can, you can take it as you will and have a look around uh, and see what you think. Lots of bits sticking out the back of the ATR. It's quite interesting. Um, I don't know entirely what this is for. I, this is presumably some sort of tail skid bumper. I don't know whether it has a sensor. The Dash 8Q400 had a sensor back there that would alert you in the flight deck if you had scraped the tail. Moving on to the vertical stabilizer. Some interesting added on vortex generators up here uh, at the top of the tail. I don't know why they would be there. So uh, again, it shows the care that's gone in and this is what you get with these refined or extended versions of airliners that they have to start adding bits on to make sure that they they are still working as intended from the original design or test pilots maybe don't like something so they they get bits added on <laughs> so uh yeah you see it on the 737 max as well there's lots and lots of bits on it but there we go so overall i'm uh, yeah very happy with the model like i say quite clean um not the most detailed thing ever but also absolutely uh, nothing that I feel is worth complaining about from for me and uh, lots of decals and nice clear texturing on it look at that you can zoom right in and it's all there so let's get the airplane powered up and get it on the flight so here we are on the flight deck of the ATR 72 and you'll see big glass screens it is the modern variant as I say and we're going to see how good that system actually is I'm quite impressed with it you can click spot the yoke out the way which I will do because otherwise it will just be in the way Overall, the flight deck is nicely detailed, I think. It's got lots and lots and lots of buttons, and the texturing is quite quite good in here. You've got sort of smudges and marks around, which give away that it's not brand, brand new. I like these metal lines outside the switches. This is something that you see on A320 aircraft on the older style switches. More modern ones don't have it, so it's good to see it. Um, so quite quite pleased with that. Overall, quite, quite a nice feeling uh, flight deck. With lots of details, and again, lots and lots of stickers and decals, and all the text is really sharp. You can see all the CBs. Again, this CB panel straight out of an A320 as well. Really amazing to see the uh, the overlap here. It's 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 much more than I thought it would be. Right, let's get it powered on. To do that, I'm going to use the built-in checklist initially, and I'll talk about this as we go through. But there is actually a checklist system the ATR has in its own screens, which is really quite impressive, and we'll use that later on. So the power-up checklist is quite straightforward. Battery master on, MFC self-test complete. Now, as far as I can tell, the self-test is automatic, but we'll show you the battery master. So, as I say, battery master on, this is the battery master. It's on the overhead panel. It's in the off position. Lift up the guard. I click it forward to on. Close the guard. The MFCs are over here and you can see them light up with fault, fault, flash, you get a few warnings, a few dings, and then there we go. Now the rest of the airplane comes to life and I believe that's a self-test complete, but I'm not sure. That's it for the power up. That's not good enough though really, is it? What we've done here is we've just turned on the batteries. Next is the final copy preparation. This one is I'm not going to run through until we've set up the airplane pretty much ready to go. Before rotation is before we get one of the engines spinning. So I'm going to get rid of that checklist now. 
What we're going to do is run through a flow on the overhead panel. Before we do that, you can see it's quite gloomy, so let's get some lights on. On the lower pedestal, lights. Weirdly, you scroll these two the wrong way. I have to scroll down, and this one I scroll to the right, and there we go. And now we have some uh, lights, I hoped, but that hasn't worked on the overhead. Ah, I know why, because we haven't got power. <laughs> okay, so let's get power to the aircraft. To do that, let's go over to our EFB, aircraft, select ground power. Now on the overhead panel, just like on the Airbus, you see this available light. It's in two positions, one down here on the main electric power, one over here on the AC wild power. This connects into the DC, and I turn it on, and now we get lights and backing lights on the overhead panel. And we also have AC available if we want it, which can power the AC based systems on the ground. I'm going to turn them both on because they both become available. I don't actually know what the real ATR would use, whether it would use both or not, DC and AC external power. But either way, they're both available, so let's use them. Ultimately, I don't think having this one off creates too many issues, except things, some certain, certain systems that may not run. But let's leave it all on for now. Good. Now we're in a better position. The remaining screens can come on because we're not just relying on the batteries. We're not discharging the batteries anymore, and the aircraft is powering up. By the way, before we had done that, you can also go over here, open this panel and have a look at the electrics of the aircraft and check, for example, the battery voltage uh, and current being drawn from it. And you can check the external power as well and check that it is running at a suitable um, frequency before you want to use it and voltage. So there we go. So that is all modeled, just a sign of the details in this aircraft, which I've been pleasantly surprised with, but we'll see more as we go through and I'll let you be the judge of that. Good. So now, like I say, the power up of the aircraft, really, you need to get some external power going. There is no APU on the ATR. It does not have an auxiliary power unit, so we can't generate our own power. The only way to do that would be to start up the engine. So you could start up engine 2 and use it as an auxiliary power unit. For today's video, I'm not going to do that, but I will show you how that system works. And it's to do with propeller braking, where you actually run the engine but keep the propeller still. So ATRs on turnarounds will often do that so they don't have to plug in if there's no ground power available. But there we go. Um, that is the aircraft powered up and the, the lights are on. Now, before we go further, let's take a quick look at the electronic flight bag. Over here, you can see the payload, performance, aircraft, maintenance and options tabs. First of all, in payload, what we're going to look at is the uh, weights of the aircraft. You don't enter them here. This just takes it from what you enter later on into the FMC system of the ATR. Now, I'm not going to do that just yet. We'll do that later on, but that is not something we can adjust. Next is performance. And again, once we've loaded in the weights, it will give us the correct speeds for V1, VR and V2. And it will show us the distance required. Aircraft tab, let's open up the cargo door, main door, you can put the tail prop on and the service door, the chocks, usual things, and you can set up the settings. So we were in cold and dark, you can swap it to external power, hotel mode, or even have the engines running. Really great to see panel states and they work very well. Maintenance tab, you can refill your oxygen, reset your brake temperatures and uh, reset your fire protection if you've used it. Finally, options, you can set the units, synchronize your altimeters. I've got it set to ER, so avionics mode. And uh, over here, I've got throttle setup, uh, this is important. You click on this and now you can set up your throttles. Now this is, these are quite different in the ATR, but let's run through it briefly uh, and we'll talk about it again once we get going. In the ATR, you have uh, power levers here and condition levers over here. The ATR is a turboprop aircraft. I flew a turboprop, the Q400, as I said, and it was very, very similar to this system. So let's look at what we're actually doing. With these two power levers over here, what we're doing is controlling the power going to the engine. So this is effectively our thrust levers like they would be in the A320. But we're using a propeller aeroplane. If we jump outside, I can show you, if we swing around, the engine. Here we go. So this is a turboprop. So what's, what's the deal with a turboprop engine? How does this engine work? What happens is, as we apply power, let's say the engine was running, as we apply power and push our power levers forward, more fuel is added to the engine and it pushes out more air. There's a jet engine inside here and it pushes that air over a turbine at the back. That spins the propeller at the front, just like on a, a jet engine. The difference is it's a, instead of a big fan at the front, it's this propeller. What this propeller can do, unlike a jet engine, is this propeller can change the angle of the blades. So what happens is as I apply more power to the engines, the speed of the engine inside increases and the propeller would try and increase in speed, obviously. So what the airplane does is instead of letting the propeller increase in speed, it adds or the computers inside add more propeller pitch. So they increase the angle of this propeller blade compared to the airflow. 
that pushes more air back which slows the propeller down and keeps it therefore at the same speed. Now it sounds confusing, it, what it means is the propeller runs at the same speed all the time. Now I say all the time, I mean once you have it set to a setting. As we go through different settings uh, or different flight phases, we might change the speed of the propeller. So on the Dash 8 for example, 1020, 1020 RPM was the propeller's speed for takeoff. Then in the climb we would set it to 900 RPM and in the cruise 850. But even in the cruise at 850, and we would also use that for the descent, 850 RPM, as you change power setting, the propeller would change pitch. It would not change speed. That's why when you fly as a passenger in an ATR, you can't, or a turboprop aircraft, you often can't tell when the power is changing so much. What's happening is, as the power is increased and decreased, the propeller keeps spinning at the same speed, and all it does is change the pitch of the blades. It's a bit like changing gear in your car. As you increase the... Uh, speed of the propeller is like going down into first gear. As a result, if you need lots of power or you need an instant response from the engines, you'll actually have the propellers at a higher RPM. So when we're low down, when we're taking off and when we're going around, we'll have the propeller spinning as fast as it at its higher setting. And that way we get instant power out of it. But as we get up and get into the thinner air and we're trying to go faster, we need to go up the gears. So we lower the speed of the propeller, which increases the blade angle, pushes more air backwards. Less responsive, but more speed uh, or more um, and or certainly a better uh, experience for the passengers. So that is what we're doing with a turboprop and the HR uses the same system. There is some exhaust out the back, but it doesn't really provide thrust like a jet. It just happens to be how a jet, the jet inside needs to exhaust. But like I say, these propellers spin freely. So as I was saying earlier, engine number two can be used like an APU. And in that case, what you would do is start up the engine inside, but you would hold the propeller still because, as I said, it's not connected directly to the jet engine inside. It just works by air blasting over the turbine at the back, which spins the propeller at the front. So you can hold the propeller still, turn on the jet engine and use it for electrical power. So that is what they use here. The Dash 8 has an APU instead, but there we go. So. Bringing back to the power levers, what are we actually trying to achieve with them then? So they have these positions GI, which is ground idle. That's a lower setting, a low power setting where the propellers will spin slower than they would normally at those settings I was discussing. Above that is the flight idle gate. That is the lowest you'll set it to in flight. This is where the propellers will stay at the, the RPM you've requested. This is the gust lock, so I'm just going to remove the gust lock out of the way. Um, above that, you can see that we're in the normal power ranges. And here you have what's called the notch setting. This is like the rated gate. So there's a feel here where you can feel the power levers go in here, I believe. And this is where you'll set them for takeoff thrust. And then as you fly through the phases, you can adjust the power management panel, MCT, max continuous thrust, climb thrust, and cruise thrust. So that's what you'll do. Um, and then in this notch setting here, the engine will just go to whatever the power management panel is demanding. So takeoff means that this will be at takeoff. Below GI is the reverse section, just like uh, normal aircraft. So that is our power setting with these levers. Over on the right, we have the condition levers. These are to control the speed of the propeller, which we talked about already. So when we turn on the engine, to add fuel, you move them up into the feather position. It's called feather because it means the propeller is turned across the air. It's not spinning very fast. It's actually very, very slow, but it's just sort of whipping around. Then you move it to auto and it will accelerate and that's when the propellers would adjust their own speed. The dash, we used to do that ourselves. The ATR seems to be a bit cleverer, it does an auto position. Above that, the override is you get them spinning maximum and you would put them there if you need maximum power out of those propellers straight away. For example, uh, I don't know, maybe in a, a winch here or something like that. I'm not sure when you would use that in the ATR, but that's what it's there for. I would imagine the auto position could sense a lot of these things. So that's what these do. Mostly they're going to sit in auto after our engine started. But I'll show you all of this as we go through the flight. So how do we set up using this EFB, these power levers? Well, like I say, they're in ground idle now. What you do is you go to the throttle calibration. I'm using the Thrustmaster TCA quadrant. I've selected dual axes because I have two propellers. So I want to control them separately. Or two power levers, sorry. And then I've got reverse on the same axes because I have my axes uh, with reverse on. Then you've got ramp notch idle. So I've set mine to the idle position before reverse, and then you can select set and set. And that's what I've done. And now I have the idle position. Notch is where you want your takeoff power, um, and it's a setting you need to be able to feel. So if you're using the Thrustmaster TCA Airbus, I highly recommend setting your notch to the Flex MCT gate, which is where you would set your TCA for takeoff. 
um, but or you can put it wherever you just it's just good to be able to feel it because that's where you're going to leave them for takeoff and then you can bring the power back to climb as you climb away sort of the most power we're expecting to use in the flight um, and it changes as you go through the dash 8 had a very similar system it had a, a notch sort of area above that is ramp now ramp it starts at this red area and then you can squeeze through it so if you need more power than the notch or the rated you can push past it and then you can keep pushing and it pushes back against you but you you can push it all the way forwards if you need to the important thing is the ramp date gate is not full power um, otherwise it will complain at you so you want to have the th i've got ramp set slightly before the end so that's where i've selected ramp set and then i just squeeze past it i'm not expecting to use ramp much i'm not too worried so these are the settings I've got. So you can see there, my thrust lever is fully forward, gives me 16384, but I've got ramp set to 14336. So set your thrust levers to the idle position, set idle, then set them to the second click, I would, and then you can set notch, and then the bit further up from that, I would set ramp, and then you can adjust the tolerances as required. Then you press validate, it tells you it's okay, and then you press okay, and then it should work. And then here we go, my thrust levers are at idle, shows me the ATR power levers in the ground idle position. Then a bit above that is a flight idle position. Then you can squeeze it through all the way to notch up there. Now, once you get in the air, uh, this would automatically not let you go to ground idle. So that's why I've got it set like this, because it doesn't actually matter. In the real aircraft, you would actually obviously only sit here in flight, but we'll see that later on. This is just how I've been using it so far. I might see it change it as we go forward. Anyway, that is the end of the EFB for now. Let us run through a flow on the overhead panel, get the aeroplane set up, weight it up, and then we'll start the engines. So on the overhead panel now, I'm going to run through an Airbus sort of flow. Down here, we have the wiper, the storm light, standby compass, and dome light, and then we have the cabin light, which you can turn on and off like this. So if you're finding that your dome light's on bright, but you don't want it on, you need to flick this one off as well. I've had this at night thinking that the lights were a bit buggy, but actually they were fine. <laughs> I just need this switch. You can call the cabin crew and you can call the mechanic outside. Pretty good, the Dash 8 did not have this because you're so low down, but there we go. By the way, a fun feature of the ATR that I really like is that you can then pass out paperwork to the uh, engineer outside because the windows don't open. The Dash 8 did not have a system like this, but the reason it didn't is because on the Dash 8, you could just walk out and go out the front door here. But obviously this is a cargo door, it will be closed later on in the process, so you wouldn't be able to um, to get to your dispatcher very easily so they quite cleverly thought of a system for getting paperwork out to uh, people outside i can't make it fully open sadly but uh, yeah that's a quite an interesting feature so back on the overhead panel that's how you call them you've got your fuel panel here very simple really you've got the valves in line showing that the fuel can run to the engines and the cross feed is off uh, you can turn on the pump and it gets rid of the low pressure turn it off again you get the low pressure works on both sides up here we have a door panel, interestingly not shown on the electronic displays, but there it is. Uh, we've got the emergency service and cabin doors unlocked. You can test those as well. Above that, the MFC computers, the backup landing gear lights. So these are the same triangles we have on the Airbus. I think that's pretty cool. Uh, I'm not sure what the TLU is, but we're going to leave it in auto. You can do a fire test on the overheads and the squib test, which lights up the squib lights. Over here, we've got the copy of voice recorder. Actually, no, let's go down to the bottom, sorry. So down here we'll have the lights, so beacon should be off actually. Nav lights on, logo lights on, strobes off, taxi lights off, wing off, and landing lights off. You'll notice, just like the Airbus, forward is off, backwards is on. I think that's quite interesting. Uh, the dash was the opposite, Boeing's are the opposite. But again, loads and loads of Airbus pedigree in here. Even these screws look just like some of the Airbus ones. Propeller brake is off, so we've talked about this already. This is the system that allows us to hold that propeller still and start up engine two as an APU. We're, I'm gonna show you that when we do get started. For now, I'm going to leave it in the off position. You can see it's ready, which is a good sign. A few conditions need to be met for that to be ready, but there it is. Engine start, leave it off for now. And these are the starter buttons, manual ignition, guarded and off. External power is on. I'm going to turn on the DC generators, ready for when we start up the engines. Just like the Airbus, a lot of these switches like to be left on, as far as I can tell. Uh, and they'll just give you the fault light when they're not running, just like the A320. Uh, in fact, the switch is basically identical. Up here, we have more of the electrics, but we're going to leave all of this off. Uh, the transformer rectifier unit is for turning the DC power into AC, but I'm going to leave that off as well. Um, for now, I think it's in the checklist later. A copy of voice recorder will leave alone. Up here, we have the ELT we're not going to touch. I'm going to turn on the auxiliary hydraulic pressure. You would contact the ground crew before pressurizing that. I'm going to leave those on. They're powered, I believe, because we have the AC power here. And I'll put on the AC generators ready for when we go. Down here, probe heat. So this is for heating the pitot probes. can be off and the windshield heat off for now. 
Down here, the anti-icing panel is a very confusing panel to me. Um, it's more complex almost than the Dash 8, which is quite impressive. The Dash 8 was pretty good. But uh, yeah, we're going to leave all this off for now. I'm not expecting icing today. We'll need an ATR pilot to explain this to us. Down here, signs, emergency lights to arm, just like the A320. Seatbelts on, no devices on. It's called no device because back on this aircraft, we would have, uh, or this, the signs would actually show, instead of no smoking, it would say, um, you're not allowed to use your electronic devices. That's interesting because that was a, it's an interesting idea to put on an aircraft, but already we're at the point where most devices or a lot of devices can be used, you know, um, obviously not using mobile connection, but they can use, uh, your, you know, you can use your iPod or whatever or your phone to listen to music for most of the flight, if not all of the flight. So it's interesting that uh, this has already become outdated, even though it was quite a modern thing when it came in. Over here, annunciator lights, annunciator lights put to bright, wiper off. Our pressurization panel, everything's on just with the fault lights, as you would expect. Temperature inside the airplane, pretty hot actually. Might need to get some air through soon. And I'll turn on the oxygen supply if we need it for pressurization reasons. Dash 8 did not have a passenger supply of oxygen, but there we go. Okay, that is the overhead panel. Now let's move down to the FGCP flight guidance control panel. This, unlike coming from an Airbus, actually looks straight out of a Dash 8 Q100. I really like it. It reminds me so much of the aircraft I used to fly. I'm not going to touch it just yet because we haven't set up our route or anything in the uh, computer. So we'll leave that as it is for now. We will talk about it later. Here you have the standby compass. You can just drop it down. Quite clever that it stows away. Airbus is very good at stowing <laughs> standby compasses. As we know, the Airbus one fits away up there. Quite good. Lots of aircraft just leave them out all the time. <laughs> then we have our screen. So we have the captain's PFD and nav display. And then an engine display in the middle and sort of systems pages. Uh, and then we have another nav display and the PFD for the first officer. Interesting to note that you can change the format on all of these using this little panel down here. This is similar to the Dash 8. When you don't have enough screens and you want more systems displayed, you can then change these nav displays to have different systems showing. So you press system and there we go. It shows us the hydraulics, which will pressurize nicely. By the way, if I turn off those auxiliary pumps, the hydraulics will be depressurized because of course the engines aren't running. And you can see it depressurizes on here. Just evidence that in the background, these systems are running. So I'll put them back on. There we go. Um, you can change the systems panel again by pressing system here and we get the engine and fuel so we can see that, uh, how much fuel is on the aircraft um, and if I press it again we will see the pressurization, cabin altitude and so on and then the uh, packs and how the bleeds are working. Pretty modern stuff uh, and here's the electronics. It's very impressive actually. This is These are neat systems. I like the uh, the pictures they use but yeah there we go. If I then press it back to ND I get the navigation display. And you can also press it to perf and get the performance display where you can, once we've loaded in the weights, we'll see different takeoff speeds and so on. Very clever stuff, very clever stuff. Vid gives you the video in the rear of, or behind the flight deck in that cargo hold. Very good idea. Uh, and map, this is really clever. We can actually zoom into the airport once I've loaded it in and you'll be able to see where we are parked. Clever stuff, very clever. I like it a lot. MISC doesn't do anything right now. So I'm going to put it back to um, ND for now. In the middle screen, you'll see we have the a per permanent sort of engine display. And below it, we have the procedure menu. menu. This is, allows us to run through checklists uh, on here instead of having to use the inbuilt checklist system of Microsoft Flight Simulator. Now, the advantage of the one in Microsoft Flight Simulator is I can actually click on the eye and it will point me at the right switch. And that does work on this aircraft, which is really great. But I think it's quite clever to use the one in the aircraft. I think it's quite nice. Well worth brightening up these screens, by the way, which I'm going to do now. Just make sure that we can all see everything as best we can. I think they're fully bright. Good. So that is what we're going to use uh, when we run the checklist later. Something else to note about these screens is in the EFB, if you go to options, you can see the display click spot and you can actually change the range and format of these displays by clicking next to them. So I can scroll through them here. Now there's nothing in this one, but if I click here, left and right, you can change the format and I can change the range clicking up and down. And the diagram is done here. If I press on the top right square, it should bring up a systems page, I guess. Um, it's quite, quite something to get used to, but there we go. You can bring up the bearing needles if you had them. I need to get rid of that. Hold on, let's escape that. Okay. Um, yeah, you can click through. Um, and yeah, it's clever stuff. Same over here. 
So for doing those checklists, I can click on this left side and you can see there's up, down and validate. The reason is to actually control those checklists, you would use these arrows here, up, down, and then this is the validate, V for validate. So you can see, I can see final copy preparation, one out of two. If I press the V, it goes in there to validate it. But I find that obviously quite tricky as everyone would. So what you can actually do is click on the left, go down, and then the lower area is the V, validate, and it brings me up the checklist. So we're gonna see that in just a moment as uh, as we go through the, the actual checks and startup. Down on this pedestal, we've talked about the power levers. We've got them set in ground idle. We can press the hide aux pump to increase pressure in the parking brake if we need it. Parking brake should actually be back and on. There we go, and I'm just gonna add some pressure. Condition levers are in fuel shut off, flaps are at zero. Um, as we move down, uh, we can see the MFD to controls we've seen. This is for adjusting our nav display control, so changing the format and the range and which needles we show, but we can do all of that by clicking on the screen as we've discussed. And here's our comms panel for listening and our lights panel, and this is the trimmers, rudder trim and uh, Adron trim. And there we go. That is a rough overview of the, the central part of the ATR flight deck. Having said that, there's two panels I haven't talked about. Um, on this center one, we need to look at this. This is the power management panel. As I showed you earlier, you can move this dial to select the rating for which the notch setting will set the engine. So we'll see that as we go through, take off for takeoff, obviously. Everything else I'm leaving off for now. This is the ATPCS, the automatic takeoff power control setting. This is used to feather the engines if there's an engine failure. Now that's a whole topping on its own, but effectively with a turboprop, if the engine fails and the propeller is still spinning, it creates a lot of drag, which is very bad. So what we need to do is feather that propeller. You turn it into the wind so it's not spinning effectively. Um, and that system does that automatically at high power settings. Over here, we have cabin pressurization. You can actually change landing elevation manually or leave it set from the FMS, which is what I'm going to do. I'm going to leave everything else in sort of its automatic mode. Uh, now let's load up the FMS for our flight. So this is very Airbus style, although it does have a different init sort of boeing -y style. So go through to init, you can see the date, um, and then we're going to enter our route. So first of all, I'm going to put in a flight plan, route, Echo Golf Hotel India, and we're going to Echo Golf, and let me just get this right, we're going to Jersey, sorry, Guernsey, Echo Golf Juliet Bravo. Enter the route. That's going to be executed. Then to enter a departure, you select next to it, just like you would at uh, on the Airbus. I'm going to take off runway 20. There's no SID list here, so I'm just going to execute that. But you could put in the SID, obviously, if it was there, and then it would run in nav. After takeoff, I'm going to route directly to the waypoint uh, AUTAC. You could, of course, put in airways after your SID and all sorts. This is a very normal style. But we're going to go to AUTAC, so I'm just going to put that in directly and then execute. My arrival into Jersey, uh, Guernsey, I'm gonna select the airfield. I'm gonna choose my approach, ILS runway 27, and we're arriving via the Autac 1 Victor. So I'm gonna scroll through. Something to note here, as you scroll through, you press next and previous, but you'll notice that they do appear on the right and left. On the Airbus, obviously, they only appear one side, um, and then the right would be something different, so I, I lost them before. But anyway, Autac 1 Victor, um, and I'm just gonna go straight to that effectively into the ILS. So execute. So there we go. Take off, get route to AUTAC, and then to the center fix. I'm going to clear the discontinuity. Very simple route today. And enter. There we go. And as uh, we can see now, hopefully, if we move the nav display format, now I don't want to, it keeps trying to tune nav aids. So to tune the nav aids, you can select the box and then you can type it into this panel here. So let's say we want to put Unicom up. I can type 122 decimal 8 and then enter but it does have a habit of, of thinking you're clicking on it so there we go now i can change the format and then increase the range and then you can see autac and then there's straight into Guernsey. so pretty straightforward route pretty good over here now fms1 is showing autac as the two-way point great so that is the route loaded to get back to the init i can press data init uh, and that is the flight plan done position init i don't think we need to do much to this but it's got the last position a gps position so I'm just going to put that in as the init position and initialize the sensors. But there we go. And on status, hopefully. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if you have to do that every time, but it seems to work when you do. Um, so let's pause on it. Flight plan in it. Next is going to be weight. Now, 
this is where it gets a little bit interesting. If I go back over here to payload on the EFB, you can see that we don't have the, any numbers in here because I haven't loaded them into the FMS. If you go to Microsoft Flight Simulator's payload section, we can see that what have we got on board? We have an empty weight of 13 tons, payload of 6.6 .6 tons and 2.5 tons of fuel. So this gives us a zero fuel weight of 13, just over 13 tons plus 6.6, .6, gives us a zero fuel weight of 19.6 tons effectively, just over 19.6. So now I'm gonna enter that down here as a zero fuel weight. The fuel on board, uh, at the moment is 2.5 tons. I don't want that much fuel, so I'm going to have it in kilos. I'm going to lower the fuel to 2 tons, or just under 2 tons. We've now got 1994. Fuel on board gives us a gross weight of 21,594. Why I'm showing you that in that order is it's really important, you know, that you need to change the weight and balance in here if you want to change it. Because I'll show you now, without that, it doesn't work properly. Um, over here, you can see it's just taken the numbers from what I've just typed in, 1994 and 19.6, okay? Now, what I'm going to do is, if I hadn't looked at that weight and balance page, let's say you just typed in, I want two 500 and a zero fuel weight of 19, or let's put it much lower, let's put in 18 tons. And you type it in, and it says gross weight 20.5. This says 20.5 over here, and you go, okay, great. You'll also notice the fuel on board figure goes to 2.5 tons over here. It matches what we typed in. That's all that number is. But if we go to the weight and balance, I'm going to reveal that we still have only two tons of fuel. We don't actually have 2.5, despite this number showing it. So really important. And um, this is a big thing in aviation, getting the fuel right, obviously. So 2.5 tons, we only have two tons on board because this is the master. This is what you need to actually look at. You can see as well, our payload is actually still 6617. So our weights are also heavier. So this is what matters. You've got to get that right. There's no, I can't find a way to load it in otherwise. There might be, but for now, if you're like me and you're just starting out with this aircraft, do check this page um, because it can get confusing. And you can see it as well. It says fuel use 280. It just starts adding numbers as you start changing around with the fuel. So let's put it back to how we know we have it. We have 19.6 on board. Nineteen point six and one nine nine four of fuel. That's better. Taking off at just over twenty one tons, ninety six one nine nine four. That's worked, and our fuel on board figure one nine nine zero. There we go. So that is our aircraft loaded up with uh, fuel and payload. Now this gives us a takeoff CG and a takeoff trim. It's also on the EFB. You can press set. And I press set and it puts the 1.1 up trim on here, which is in the green band for takeoff on the pitch trim. Next thing to see is if we go to return, perfinit, you can change your cruise altitude and so on. So we're planning to cruise today at just 12,000 feet. It's a short flight. Oh, no, not that low. There we go. Um, cruise on max cruise. And there we go. So pretty good uh, and I'm sure there's lots of things I've missed but that's it there's our flight plan done and the FMC loaded we can go to the performance tab here and see our weight so v1 of 111 vr 111 v2 114 or I can go here and press perf and you'll see on here it shows us the zero fuel weight fuel on board reserve fuel the factor the trim the cg it's clever stuff and there's our speeds displayed and it shows you as well if you're in icing conditions what you need to do to change the uh, the speeds as well and the takeoff torque setting we're going to go with 90 percent today and this is for the approach phase good now i'm just going to put that back to the nd and i'll show you why in just a moment final step for us then before starting up let's load up our fgcp so I need the aircraft to, I'm going to climb to 3,000 feet. You do whatever your clearance is, obviously, but uh, yeah, 3,000 feet, which will say up here. Now, it's going to be quite hard for me to show you because these screens are quite fine detail on the text, but I'm going to put out cell 3,000 to 3,000, which is what we're going to climb to initially. I've got the couple button set to the left-hand side because I'm flying from this side. Flight directors both need to be on. So if they're off, you get nothing, but if I press it, you can see FD. And I want that on for both, so I get the um, both sides up and running. There we go. Good. 
Next, um, I want to have the heading bug set with where I'm going, runway 20. Now you can scroll the heading bug like this, or what you can do is once you're facing the right way, you can actually push it in and it will synchronize it. So I'm just going to do that when we line up and I'll probably forget. Course bar doesn't really matter because we're going with the FMS course. And over here, I need this set to FM1. This is our data source. If I set it to ILS2, it will tune an ILS frequency or a VOR for flying like that. And obviously, you can then do VOR2 or FMS2. So let's add that one on the FMS1 and this side, FMS2. Your damper won't come on until we're in the air. Uh, and then the other modes, I'm going to leave alone for now. I'm not entirely familiar with what modes the ATR takes off in. I'm just going to take off normally um, and then engage your damper and uh, the IAS mode is my plan to climb up to 3,000 feet and then put it into nav. I don't know whether you would do that now or later on, or I suspect you would press the, these go around buttons uh, to get the FMAs. We can try that, go around, and then we get go around, go around. Maybe that's the mode we'd start off in. I'm not entirely sure. <laughs> that would do for me for now. The rest of this we'll talk about in flight. By the way, this little tail stopper at the back is quite fun. You do see it on ATRs. It has to be put here because um, the ATR boards through the rear steps only. This is uh, a bit of a, a strange thing about the ATR. And this is what makes it just one of those interesting aeroplanes. It doesn't have steps at the front. And it's quite a long aeroplane, the ATR-72. So there is a risk of it, with people getting on at the back, of chipping onto its tail. So that's there just to protect the aircraft. It's quite a sensible idea. As you can see, all the doors are open. So let's um, get the aeroplane ready to go. What I will do is let's just jump in, have a quick look through the, the, the cabin of this aircraft. I haven't seen it um, yet, actually. <laughs> I've been so busy trying to get to grips with the flight deck. So here we go into the cabin. As you can see, it is model 2 by 2 seating in the ATR. And what I was curious about was the overhead light. Does it show the devices light? Yes, it does. No devices. <laughs> and it's a picture of an iPod on a laptop. Yeah, I'm sure it was a great idea at the time, <laughs> but already perhaps not quite as useful as it could have been. So let's get the doors closed up and we're going to start up engine two and just show you how to use that as like a little APU. Okay, so on board now, I've removed the car, I closed the cargo doors, just left the ground power running um, and we've removed the chocks. So let's run into our checklist. Now I'm going to leave the left side on the navigation display and on the right side is the systems page and I'll show you why. If you leave a systems page up as you run through the checklist, it will automatically show you the right page. It's so clever. I really like it. Parking brake, engaged, pressurized, and checked. So it is engaged. I can't find the pressure panel. I thought it would be up here, but I'm going <laughs> to say that it has enough pressure. Checked. Altimeter set and checked. We've got 1013, and that is checked. Landing elevation set. It's automatic, so we've got it um, set by the FMS. Checked. FMS set, we've done. Fuel quantity, fuel on boards. So that brings up, it would bring up this screen anyway, the engine screen. And you can see here, 980 kilos on both sides. That's what we wanted, just under two tons tick engine fuel used reset and see how it swaps to this page because on here i can reset the fuel used you can see it says 280 that was from the previous flight reset fuel used it goes to zero um, you can just click on it on the screen set and then uh, yeah validate memo panel check there's nothing showing validate power management to take off this is the power management and it's set to take off you'll notice there's two little sections this dial but we're going to run them together obviously but in case you had a failure or something you might change that that's validate, procedure complete, validate again. You can see fuel feed low pressure. It's complaining because the fuel pumps aren't on. So I'm actually going to turn those on now. I'm not sure when they would come on, but now they're running. That removes the fuel feed pressure checklist. So it even has a normal checklist in here. Very clever. Next checklist before propeller rotation. So let's press validate, CDLS on. I'm not entirely sure what the CDLS is. So I'm going to not get too concerned with it. Um, and then as we'll say that that is on FMS takeoff data confirmed. So you can see here the speed. We talked about our speeds. If I go to perf, um, we're going to rotate at 111 and our V1 is 111 as well. If I press select, that should go into auto mode. And I'm hoping that's going to show us the correct speeds as we go. If not, I need to remember these speeds on here. Um, we'll say done. Trims. Yeah, we can see they're all at zero and the pitch trim is set. Tail prop is on board. That was that little um, uh, stick outside to protect the tail. Doors are closed. So interestingly, not on the systems page as much. Oh, actually, they are on the systems page. There we go. I think we can see the doors there. Uh, but also, I can see on the overhead panel, no lights on the doors. 
I suppose that overhead panel is probably there before the electronic screens. Seatbelts on, and then we're going to turn on the beacon. Beacon on. Now you notice it says before propeller rotation. This is because you might have done this checklist. You might be running with the engine already running, so it's not really engine start. Um, but there we go, procedure is completed. Tick through. No active procedure now. So let's just look at normal. What one's next? Next one will be before propeller rotation, which we've done, and then it'll be before taxi. So now we need to start up the engines, and then we can go from there. So let's start up engine number two first, and then use it as a little APU as we push back. Now this is where you need to go back into the Microsoft checklist, because in here you can see we have a engine start checklist. And this actually tells you how to start the engine, which is really quite handy when you're new to this aeroplane. No surprise, mainly on the overhead panel. Starter selector goes to A and B. So this is our starter selector. Scroll all the way down to A and B. I think you could probably use A or B as well, but there we go. Fuel pump two on. I've already turned them on. Tick. Right engine starter button goes on. As soon as I do this, it will electrically spin around the inside of the engine. So start on. Condition lever. As soon as we get 10% NH, we can turn to fuel on. So here's our NH. It's already at 10%. And what we're going to do now is put the fuel to feather. Now we get light up, NH accelerates, we get an ITT temperature, and the, at 45%, which is already passed, the starter should go out, which it has. Next, fuel pump one would go on, uh, and then you can start up engine number one in exactly the same way. But we're not going to do that just yet. We're just going to use this engine two as an APU. Now, as you can see, the propeller is spinning. It's in the feather position making a really nice fluttering sound actually. I like that, just like they do. This is sort of, the plane sort of buffets a lot with lots of air going off in funny directions when you have them in feather. They spin very slowly. But the good news is our DC generator two has come online and, but our AC generator two is off because it's not, it's at low speed. What I can do though is put the prop brake on now. So I lift up the guard and then put it on and close the guard. Now you remember it says ready and look at that, it's holding the engine still. Now I don't know if you could do that from an engine that was already spinning, but that's what I've done. I assume you could if you didn't want to shut it down. So it's now holding that engine still. Um, so the engine's running, but that propeller is still. Now we've lost some of the hydraulics, but uh, yeah, that seems to be <laughs> okay. Um, good. The GPU has turned off automatically, or it seems to have disappeared. Even so we're now running with our onboard power effectively. We're being powered by the DC generator on the number two engine. Let's push back. Now, this is a really cool feature of the ATR. It's interesting to note that the uh, feathering noise, I can still hear that propeller sort of feathering. So I think there's something to the sound on this aircraft. It's slightly, slightly out of sync. Um, uh, slightly, I can say. <laughs> I can hear that feathering propeller, even though I know it's just the jet running. But there we go. So pushing back now, and then we'll get the other engine running. So, of course, brakes release for the pushback. Back we go. Startup engine number one. So it's on A and B. Just press start on one. Ten percent NH. Put the fuel on. Engine will light up. There we go, lighting up quickly. Probably enough pushback. So the brake. Away they go. And now we're in an aircraft with two engines running, but just one propeller spinning. Quite a strange system, but there we go. They are both up and running. What I'm going to do now, release the prop brake. If I can get to it. There we go. Off. And now that engine can accelerate up to the feather position. Ground crew is leaving. And there we go. Engines are now up and running. So we need to move on to our before taxi checklist now. Which doesn't actually cover everything. Interesting. Okay. And if we look in the checklist in here. Before taxi. This one does cover a bit more. So the, these checklists are a little bit more comprehensive. So I'm going to use the built-in one. Uh, sorry, this one again. The Microsoft Flight Simulator checklist. So what I'm going to do is flight warning system recall. Make sure there's no additional warnings. You can see uh, the comms have gone. There we go. Uh, good. So flight warning system recall. I'm not 100% sure on where the recall button is on this, actually. 
I think it's down here. There it is, recall, just like the A320 has. It's got a whole load of warnings. Well, we know why. Propeller brake off. We've turned that off already. Cockpit communication hatch closed. That is closed. Condition levers one or two auto. So I'm going to move these forward to the auto position. What this means is the propellers will now accelerate. You can see the propeller speed by the NP percentage, by the way. So you can see them accelerating up the percentage scale to their sort of ground idle position. And you get that nice droning noise that we're so familiar with with turboprops. So they're sitting at low pitch, well that's no surprise, they're sitting at ground idle with low power, makes sense. So we've done condition levers 1 and 2 auto, anti-icing not required, although what I will do, I'm not sure if this is right yet, but we'll turn on the windshield heat and the pitot heats. Transformer rectifier unit on and check, so this is the TRU up here, lift the guard, turn it on, and then it seems to be feeding, I'm not sure what the check would actually be. Anti-skid test perform, so your anti-skid is over here, you can test it now, gives us the caution. Oh, it was anti-skid. I'm hoping that will go out. There it goes. Um, and tick that. Flaps 15 degrees. So that's the mid setting. Only two settings on the ATR. So 0, 15 and 30. So 15 degrees. Nose wheel steering on. The nose wheel steering is over here. So it needs to be in the up position. So our nose wheel steering is on already. That is ticked. Next is the taxi checklist. So take off and taxi lights. We go on. Brakes check. FGCP and FMA check. Take off config test before. Actually, looking at it, this checklist does cover most of those things. You've got flight warning system recall, which we've done. Cockpit com hatch closed. That was the little hatch we just saw on the left. Condition levers, CL1 and 2 auto, which we've done. Anti-icing we've done. TRU on and check. And just get test. Flaps 15. And we can see 15 here. Nose of string on. Okay, now I take it back. This checklist does work. It's just abbreviated, so it might be harder to read. Um, and there we go. Next will be the before taxi checklists. So, yeah, that's done good for takeoff checklist comes next okay let's get out to the runway and then we can run that one so we're going to release the parking brake not a speed brake it's all clear on the left and right and we would turn on the taxi lights there we go and away we go quite a maneuverable airplane on the ground the ATR as you'd expect really it needs to be got to get into some smaller airports Run a brake check, brakes are good. And as you can see, as I change power setting, you can hear the propeller change its pitch. The reason for that is that at these low power settings, the propeller isn't actually getting to the RPM it wants to be at. So as you change power, the propeller RPM does increase. But that's only while it's on the ground in flight. That's not how it's going to run. You can see up here on the left of the FMA, idle, idle. Tell him I'm in the ground idle gate. Now we're taking off from 2-0, which means we're going to take off in this direction and go out, climb out that way. So I'm going to head over to the holding point here before backtracking and run that next checklist. In terms of a briefing, we've talked about that we're going to climb straight out to 3,000 feet, follow the nav line straight down to ORTAC effectively. I think I'm done with the systems page, so I'm actually going to put this to uh, be my ND. And we'll come to a stop over at the holding point and run that checklist. So at the holding point now, let's take a look at our checklist. So to take off briefing, we have performed gust lock off. That is this little lever here. That goes out the way. And now we can move the power levers as we need to. And also, of course, flight controls. So I'll just show you the yoke. So we go full left, full right, neutral, full down, full up, and rudders left and right. Now, I'm not sure if there's a screen to see them, but um, luckily in Flight Simulator, we can see them outside. Curious about the controls of the ATR, you've got obviously elevator control, and then you have roll, and then there's those big roll spoilers. They obviously it looks like a very large control surface for rolling such a small airplane but it's a very stable design a high wing design so you often need it and there we go dash 8 also has roll spoilers as well so that is the flight controls checked i'll show you the rudder as well 
There it is. Big rudder needed because turboprop aircraft, obviously, if there's a problem with one of those engines, not only do you lose the thrust on one side, which will make the airplane yaw to the whichever side, uh, also you lose lift on that wing because of the prop wash disappearing. So big rudder control and manual control needed in that case. Transponder TCAS checked. So how do we do that? You need to go to this little... Um, uh, sorry, the RMS in the FMC. Here we go. Let's get rid of that yoke. And then you can change your transponder. So it's on standby. I'm going to hold it down and hope that that changes to something more useful. And I'm going to select it and then put it to on. There we go. And then return. So now the transponder out and mode is on. And we're just going to be walking 7,000. And for the TCAS, by the way, I'm going to put the... Oh, yeah, I can put the ID in here as well, uh, which is... If you're on VATSIM, you would do this. And I'm going to be... Uh, um, Arini Airline, which is A Line, A U R two two two, A U R two two two. Good. Now, quite where TCAS is, I'm afraid I have not spotted that one yet. Um, so that I'm sure it's obvious to many of you. I have not yet seen it. My apologies. So we'll validate that airflow norm over on our overhead panel got reset fan everything else seems to be in the normal position so as far as i can tell um, that is absolutely fine i'm not sure what you might have done to change that camera crew advised engine bleed will leave on external lights let's put all of the lights on so landing lights on strobe lights on maybe not wing lights probably don't need those lateral fd bar center so it seems to be centered because we're in the go around mode and rudder cam center again not sure why it's referring to that but uh, we'll say that that's done. Procedure complete. Let's go and line up. Now, again, I'm not an ATR pilot. I never have been. I'm doing my best here. Um, there's chances things that I'm doing here are out of order. Clear on the approach. Clear on the departure. Let's get ourselves over to the runway. You can hear those propellers spooling up and down. Just backtracking down the runway now. So to review, when we take off, I'm going to move the power levers all the way through to the notch, as it were. Check that we get 90% on the torque. Uh, torque is the measured power of the engines because of course like i say the speed of that propeller doesn't actually matter the torque is what matters um, so i want 90 percent on the torque and then we'll accelerate rotating at about 111 you can see the auto speed has gone to 119 um, so it seems to be like v2 plus a little bit so you can also select it manually on here and and wind the speed yourself but i'm going to leave it in the auto mode Something I'm noticing compared to the Dash 8. The Dash 8 at ground idle, which is what we're in here, is called disc on the Dash 8, and the propellers would produce no forward thrust at all. So at disc, it would just sit still on the ground. Uh, the HR seems to have a little bit of residual thrust. It, it runs away. Again, I don't know if that's how the real aircraft is or not, but certainly that's what this model is doing with me. By the way, what I wanted to show you earlier, if you press map, you can actually see here how good is this. It can zoom in. And show you where you are so you can see yourself on the actual airfield as you taxi around very clever but we're going to go back to nav display and then done it again right nav display i need to learn these click points better and there's our straight line so let's just zoom in a bit so like i say take off in the atr power lever is going all the way forward to my notch setting which is there torque is going to our takeoff setting which is should be 90 percent Or slightly under, maybe that's with the bleeds on. <laughs> um, and we're going to release the brakes. Away we go, rotating at 111. Quite sensitive on the rudder. I'm, the nose wheel steering is still on, so I wonder if that's what's causing it. Still a theme in Microsoft Flight Simulator. Not the most powerful aircraft in the world. I don't think it's as powerful, it's certainly not as powerful as a Dash 8 Q100. Dash 8 can roar off runways very quickly. This one feels a little bit more like a jet in the time it takes it to get going. Bit of an early rotation there. There's one one one. Rotate. And up we go. Not pitching too high. You can see the speed sort of washes off a little bit. Positive climb. Gear up. You can see our V2 is on the screen there. The blue V2. Bit of yaw to the left. So needing a bit of right rudder with all that power on. Good. I'm going to select nav mode and IES mode. 
engage the oil damper and the oil pilot. Not sure whether you would engage the oil pilot that early. But there we go. It's going to accelerate a little bit and then get to its auto speed mode. Again, the actual order of doing things here, I'm not sure, but IAS mode makes sense because we can climb away. We might not lower. You might want to climb at uh, a bit of a higher angle initially, but there we go. Through a thousand feet now, so we're well away and off the ground. Gear is up, leaving Southampton behind. So now we're going to go into sort of the next phase of flight. Let's move the power management from takeoff to the climb gate, which lowers it down. It reduces the RPM automatically on the engines, and it's moved us into the 170 knots regime where we want to climb away. Quite interesting that it does that. So that you can see NP has reduced now to our climb setting. Now I'm going to bring the flaps up because we're above the F, just like the Airbus. Flaps going to zero. Then it's going to go to 170 knots for the climb speed, which is there. And because I'm in IAS mode, it's going to maintain 170 knots. Climbing up to 3,000 feet. Good. So what's our next checklist? After takeoff checklist. Landing get up. Flaps zero. Power management, we're in climb. Engine bleeds are on. Taxi and takeoff lights off. Altimeters still on 1213 for now. We're climbing to flight level 120. Oh, by the way, heading bug, I knew I'd forget. If you just push it in, it centers in the middle. We're going to cruise at flight level 120, so I'm going to put that in just as it levels off. There we go. And you can see the little top of climb marker there. Or reminder, I'm not sure what that is actually. So we want to climb to flight level 120. 120 in there. It's still in L nav, but it's going to out star mode. So if I press V nav, it goes to V nav IAS. This allows the vertical navigation system to command the speed. Something to remember, this aircraft does not have auto throttle. It is just going to stay at the power setting I leave the power levers at, which in this case is the notch. And because we've said climb gate, it's going to leave it at the climb. So it's going to, all it's doing to maintain that speed is adjusting the pitch as required. So now it's going to climb at 170 knots to 12,000 feet. Let's set standard which we can push in, standard, standard, and now that is, our timbers are done, after takeoff check is complete. Uh, we did it before takeoff, obviously we did it through the other system, good. Okay, and away we go. Changing frequencies on route by clicking here and typing them into this little panel, um, as we discussed, and same for nav, if you press nav, you can do that and change them as required. If you want to point a needle at something, you can select it on here by clicking here, uh, and that will bring it up. TCAS above. So TCAS seems to be working. Maybe it's automatic. Dash 8 would climb at 210 knots. ATR 170. So it's definitely a slower aircraft as well. As you'd expect with less power. Let's have a look at some of the autopilot modes. As I said I'd, I'd show you. So let's say we want to climb in a vertical speed. I can press VS and you can see VS changes up here. This is our flight mode enunciators just like the A320. And the commanded vertical speed is here. So blue is commanded and then you've got the green showing what we're doing. So I've commanded 12, which is 1200 feet per minute. That's just what it was at when I pressed the button. If I scroll this wheel up and those down, it adjusts that down. So you can see now it's commanding 700 feet per minute and the airplane is doing 700 feet per minute. Here's the proof about the power levers though, you can see our speed is accelerating. That target is just a bug now because I'm not letting it climb in an IAS mode, it can't pitch to that. It's I'm telling it to climb at a specific vertical speed. So it's going to maintain 700, so our speed will naturally increase because our power lever is up. If you wanted to maintain that speed whilst doing a specific vertical speed, you would now need to adjust the power accordingly. Notice as you do adjust the power, our NP, the speed of that propeller, does not particularly change much at all. There's a little bit. But as I adjust, what's actually changing is the torque. Very small change in the actual speed of the propeller. And now the speed will come back. If I put it back into the rated or the notch, it would just say notch notch and it gives us whatever that speed will be. At 700 feet per minute. Not usual to climb in VS in turboprop aircraft like this, but uh, there you go. If I press IAS, what it would do is it will climb at the targeted bug speed, which in this case is 170. 
I could change that by selecting it manually and then adjusting it. So now if I increase the speed, 190, it should lower the nose, try and attain 190. Now here's an important thing to note. Let's say I want it to climb at 190 knots, which it's about to do. You can see it's got the trend arrow up and it's increasing. And now the vertical speed will rise. But I adjust the power down manually. So bring the power back. It won't have the energy. So to maintain 190 knots, it's actually going to start a descent. And I'll wind it back. Power right back now. All the way back. And here you go. It won't let me go below flight idle, which is good because <laughs> you don't want it to. And now speed's washing off. The airplane can't maintain it. But it is flying level, interestingly. So what we're going to do here pretty quickly is run out of energy and put ourselves into a potential stall situation. So not ideal. So let's get that power back on. We'll go back to the notch. Oh, there we go. Notch, notch. You can accelerate again. See, very responsive engines because turboprops are quick to respond. They're very nice like that. And then once it gets closer, it should re get, restart the climb. We're in lateral nav mode, but of course there's heading mode. So if I press the heading bug to align it, then press heading, we get heading select. And then you can maneuver the heading bug and the aircraft will adjust as required. I'm going to press VNAV again, but you can see it won't actually say select LNAV. Very clever. So it's telling me I can't do VNAV unless I'm in LNAV as well. But I can select auto speed. 170 knots seems to be the default climb speed. So let's just bring that heading bug left, left, left. So if air traffic control gives you headings, that's how you do it. Um, and it's going to keep flashing select LNAV. So I will just say IS mode. There we go, IS. I don't want to select down I don't know why. I don't know how long it's going to keep complaining at me about that. But there we go. <laughs> um, yeah, pretty pretty straightforward now, really. Back course is for using the back course on an ILS. Don't worry about that. Rarely done. Approach mode for arming the approach. It's very good. Nav mode for getting us back into the lateral navigation, which will follow the magenta line. Um, and then you've got heading mode, IS and VS mode. We talked about. And then you can press out mode to just make it level off wherever you are. There you go. Straight into out star. If you then maneuver this. 120 and then re engage a mode IS, it will arm out cell in blue and it will level off at 120 when we get up there. Speed hold mode, I think just I'm not actually sure what that does. That's a new one on me. So put it back into IS, out cell, heading cell, and there we go. Good. Pretty, like I say, pretty straightforward. Now, something I want to show you in these T tail style aircraft is the danger of a stall. If this aircraft stalls, what you can see is the air coming off the wing as it loses energy and separates from the top of the wing and we lose lift it will buff it and create swirls and, and turbulent air that then at the high angle of attack will block out the tail and therefore your elevator becomes useless you can't lower the nose it's called a deep stall and it's a dangerous position to be in we do not like deep stalls at all so aircraft with t-tail will tend to have a stick pusher what that means is and i'll show you is if we stall the aircraft, so I'm going to disconnect the autopilot and just keep putting back on the nose and take the power off. Not something you would do with the real airliner, but there you go. It will actually st stick shake when you're approaching a stall and then it will shove the yoke forward out of your hands. Dash 8 did this as well. Here we go. There's the shaker. And you can actually see it snatching forward. Now, of course, there you go. If I release my joystick, it does it properly. So let me show you that again. So, and then it shoves the nose forward out your hand. And that is accurate. That's what the aircraft have. That's what you need in an aircraft with this sort of setup because it's too risky for it to go into a stall. As we reach our level off now, you can see we're in heading cell and out start at flight level 120. We need to note that, of course, the speed will continue to increase. So, I will have to manually bring the power levers back. There you go. It's now gone to the en route speed of 245. I quite like this auto target speed. It's effectively like VNAV on a on a jet aircraft that has auto throttle system. But there we go. The Dash 8 did not have quite the same system. So whilst that's accelerating, and we're sort of pointing back towards uh, Southampton, but uh, let's tune our approach. Now, we selected it in our FMS. And if I go to flight plan, we can actually see it there. And you can see the waypoints. RS27 with the sense fix. If I go to RMS, you can see the uh, VHF, and if I go to nav, you can tune the navigation. It's auto 108.2, and 
Um, now I'm not quite sure why it's 108.2, I suppose that's the BDN VOR, but I want to tune in this uh, ILS, the Indie Golf Hotel. Now I don't know whether you would do this uh, through the automated system or not. I don't know when the automated system was selected either, so I can only apologize. But I'm going to type in, in the standby, by clicking here, 108.1, oh not there, sorry, 108 not so easy with the <laughs> parking brake off. There we go. So select it, and then I want one. Oh, done it again. I don't know why there seems to be a problem with that eight being there and not the zero. One. Oh. <laughs> eight decimal one. Enter. Now I can transfer it over. We've removed the auto mode, but now it's tuned ILS 1081. And there you go. Again, maybe you, the auto mode would eventually catch up. I don't know. I'm going to do the same in ILS 2. I'm going to select it. 108.1 and enter. Of course, we could also tune it in here um, in the nav section. So let's clear that out and back to flight plan. Good. So that's now tuned. Next, I need to set the course. So the current course bar, if I select up here, uh, ILS 1. You can see our speed, by the way, constantly increasing. So I'm just going to bring the power ever so slightly back. Uh, of course, it's currently set to 360. I need 268. So I'm going to wind the course bar to 268. And then that will be ready for our approach. Wind, wind, wind. Two six eight, And we'll do the same on this side. So let's just put that back to FM1. And this side. And this two. To 268 and that way we're set just tuning in the ILS like we normally would I have ILS tutorials available on the channel if you need one but yeah that's what we're doing here so course 268 I know it's hard for you to see but I am changing the course looking down here 268 so that is ready if we need it back to FM2 good now I get the impression there's some clever systems here that allow it to automatically swap around like the CRJ but uh, I'm not entirely confident in those so this is just to get you through as you need to Next checklist would be the descent checklist. So let's just see what there's to do in there. So flight warning system recall. So that's this recall button there. Press it and it would show you any warnings if there were any. There's not. Landing elevation check. We've set that to auto. FMS nav perf set and check. So let's now go to the uh, perf section. So if I press perf on here, I quite like this. You can see our V app today. That's going to be V app's flat full. We haven't got um, icing. So it's going to be 110. I might fly the approach at therefore 115 knots. But I'm actually going to leave it in auto mode and see what happens. You can also, of course, go to perf over here and you'll see. Um, I should. I thought it would show us the, the app, but obviously not. Oh, there we go. So it's not going to show up there. Oh, there it is. V app 1110. Good. <laughs> and there you go. Required run length, arrival runway length. 5201 feet. So it seems to know the arrival runway that we're going to based on this. That's good. Good. Um, so that is done. Validate. DHMDA, you can set and check that as required, which you can do down here. So you can see that. I can scroll it and there's DH, or I can set it to MDA. We can put in, I don't know, let's just say something. Well, actually, we'll see what it is. The MDA here for a Category A, B, or C aircraft, 536 feet. Well, that, yeah, 536. So we'll do 540. There it is. Good, so that's done. An arrival briefing before. Um, so there you go. So we're going to fly the ILS into uh, Guernsey by routing straight. I'm going to just send us a direct to the ILS in a moment. Oh, I've lost it now. <laughs> I shouldn't do that. Um, okay, go off Juliet Bravo. But we'll fly straight to the ILS onto 27 and then we will configure as we go down. And we'll talk about that as we go. So let's leave that ready to go. Let's head over. Direct 2 is quite straightforward, by the way, of course. DTO, and then I'm going to go back to Autac and Execute. If I put this screen back to the nav display, we should see that it's actually in heading select still. So now I need to engage nav. And I'm hoping it'll turn us towards Autac. You can see the FMS1 position there. And it will turn us around, take us over. And then we'll synchronize the heading bug as we go. I think this select LNAV thing is a bug because we are already in LNAV, so I'm surprised it's still complaining. VNAV out, there you go, it's got rid of it, so it'll stay at 120. 
and then we can also just put it into out mode as well if we like that instead so around we go as you see clicking the heading bug just synchronizes it heading back to autac fuel on board we've burnt hardly any fuel <laughs> basically the taxi fuel of an a320 so we've still got 1.7 tons on board these things sip fuel that's the magic of an efficient turboprop for your airline anti and deicing is a bit of a confusing thing um yeah i'm not going to go too far into it today because i don't want to get it too too wrong look at that it does have a vnav mode of sorts so there's a top of descent coming up just after autac pretty good So far, hopefully you can see that I'm quite impressed with this add-on. I think for the price, at even if you're paying the full price of 20 euros or, or just under 20 euros and 16, or just over 16 pounds, I still think it's uh, actually quite good value. The systems are there, they are working in the background and the aircraft is, uh, is responding as you would hope. In terms of the level of detail of emergencies and failures, there seems to be some of the checklists built in. It's, it's not, you know, the most detailed visual model ever made but it's also not actually one of the worst we've seen in Microsoft Flight Simulator not by a long shot so it's uh, I'm really quite pleased with it you get the functioning cabin the functioning EFB you get the uh, panel states and you get a special or custom FMS that you can load in I really like the adaptation of the ATR specific systems things like the propeller hold the uh, the noise of the the propellers as they rev up and down uh, on the ground idle to the flight idle and the feather to the uh, ground idle position and it's really i've really enjoyed it I had a great time being taken back to my turbo prop days by flying this i think it's going to open up some interesting routes as well there are some rough edges still left uh, in particular with the sound is so far where i'm seeing it but other than that i've been uh, i've been quite pleased with it of course we need a quick look at the lighting so here it is in the cruise at night uh, or in the in the sunset i should say um, and what I'll do is I'll just turn all the lights on to show you. It's got quite a lot of lights on the outside of the ATR. So let's just get a bit darker, actually. There we go. So the logo light is lighting up the tail. You've got the beacon underneath. You've got the nav lights and the strobe lights out there. Jumping into the cabin, the, it is lit up. On the overhead, like I say, you can turn that off, and then you have this sort of glow inside. And let's put on some... Let's put it back on actually and let's turn on the landing lights and the taxi lights and the wing lights. And now you can see there she is in all her glory. Lit up well. I like that you can see the lights on the pilots as well. <laughs> Getting blinded. They need their sunglasses on. <laughs> but there we go. I like the wing lights on turbo prop aircraft. Used obviously to, to get a sense of how much ice may or may not be building up on the, the aeroplane. Some of the extra switches we've got, by the way, this is the hand mic. You can just click on it to get rid of it. Um, you can see over here, captain's reading light, console light, and then you've got uh, switching for the attitude heading mode or the air data computer. Um, and you can swap screens around as required in case of a problem. So you can bring the PFD onto that display if this one were to fail. Again, pretty pleased with how well it's all, all working as I would expect it to. Very pleased, in fact. Reflecting on my dash 8 experience is also interesting not only is this panel and these switches very very similar to the, the q400 also the armrests are they're, they're not at all from an airbus this is exactly how the armrests were on the uh the dash 8 so with the little scroll wheel underneath that you would use to adjust the the angle of them whereas the airbus of course has the the clicker on the end so it's quite it's quite funny seeing how parts are being used between the, the different aircrafts um yeah really Really interesting to me as, a, as a, a pilot of both of those. We're now reaching our top of descent at Ortac. Um, I'm going to put in the procedural altitude uh, of the ILS, which is, as you can see, it's actually showing there 2000 or above. So I'm going to put 2000, it's going to outstar, I'm not sure why. Probably done something wrong there. I'm going to put 2000 feet in the window. Maybe if I just press outs. Uh, I don't know, but I'll put 2000 feet in the window. Maybe V never work, V never start. There we go. 
and uh, yeah, let it descend at the top of the descent. So flight level two zero for now. We'll set it onto the Q and H once we start our descent to synchronise that heading bug. To fly the approach in this, something I have found so far is it's quite slippery, more slippery than the Q400 was, the Dash 8, and I don't know why. I'm not entirely sure whether that's how the real aircraft is or not. Turboprop aircraft don't tend to be slippery, and by slippery I'm referring to the fact that it is hard to slow down. The reason they tend to be quite good at slowing down, and therefore they don't need speed brakes, is that the aircraft has big propellers, and as we talked about earlier, the propeller will actually windmill and create drag like a big wind turbine if you remove power from it and you don't feather it. So usually you can just bring the power right back and the aircraft will descend pretty quickly. That doesn't seem to be as easy to do in this version of the ATR-72 and that could be true of the aircraft, maybe it has a high idle point, I don't know. But uh, it's something I have noticed. I'm also not sure why DHMDA is flashing. <laughs> I have not worked that one out. But there we go. So here's our top of descent. I'm in VNAV out start. I wonder if it will start the descent for us. As ever, you're just going to need to get used to keeping your hands on the thrust levers or power levers ready to adjust as required. You can see I'm actually pretty much sitting in the notch setting here. And it's not even managing to make 245. <laughs> I don't know if we're a bit heavy or what I've done. Okay, top of descent. Passing now. There it goes, quite abruptly. <laughs> hmm, interesting. And now you can see the speed is going to run away, so you've got to be on this. I'm imagining it's aiming for a roughly idle descent. It's gone into LNAV VNAV path, so it's not an IS mode. So I'm actually going to bring the power back to idle, and I'm just curious to see what happens. You can see there we go, we're getting a lot of drag out of it up here. But on approach it seems it's slightly harder to do. I don't know, maybe it's just been the way I've been flying it. You can see 1081 ILS is here, but it's not yet getting a DME, whereas we get a bit closer. I might just turn off this MDA and stop it flashing at me. Not sure why or what I've done to upset it, but obviously something. <laughs> it's not easy for pilots to fly around with flashing things on the screen. Oh no. <laughs> I don't know what I've done but we're going to be stuck with that maybe until we get beneath it there we go idle coming back to 170 seems to be the standard sort of climb descent speed we're going out down onto a QNH now so I'm going to set that by pushing that in sorry by clicking it and then we get 1213 passing through 10,000 feet let's make sure our seatbelt signs are back on which they were I never actually turned them off and I'm going to put the landing lights on we can now run the, or I'm going to run the approach checklist. Seatbelts are on, landing lights are on, altimeters are on 1013, and the cabin altitude. And see how it brings up that screen, isn't that fantastic? Cabin altitude is descending gently. It's at 1100 feet with a differential pressure, but it is descending. So that looks like it's all working out. Which is complete. Next checklist is going to be before landing. Clever stuff, this. I like it a lot. Well thought out. I figured out why it was flashing, it's because it wasn't set on both sides. So I had to also set the MDA over on the right hand side and now it stopped flashing. So there we go. <laughs> As usual it was me. Airplane slightly fast, we're doing uh, 180 knots compared to 170, but pretty reasonable following the VNAV path. So it seems to be tuned for a pretty much idle descent, which is about what you would like to do obviously. That's uh, our most efficient way of descending in. Just zoom in again on the range. Just over 10 miles to go. We've got a 19 DME on the ILS now showing up. Now the island's over here coming into view. We're still doing 180 knots. Now that's pretty slow in the descent, but as we get within 10 miles, that's about normal actually of what an Airbus can do. So it's time really that I want to take control of this and start slowing down. To do that, what I'm going to do is put the aircraft into heading select as if we were being vectored. So click on the heading bug and then heading select. And then I'm going to put it into vertical speed as well. But you could, of course, use the um, uh, the VNAV option as we've seen. And then I'm going to change the source to RS1 and over on the other side, RS2. You can see now the RS is identified. Glides up slightly beneath us, so we are a little bit high as we come in. But you can see the flat limiting speed showing up there. What I'm going to do then is 
hope that that's going to come in. We're about eight miles. We're actually a little bit high, um, and the gear limiting speed is pretty close to where we are. I'm going to lower the landing gear to see if that helps us out. So gear down. And there you can see the barber's pole. The dash 8 did not have that. I'm going to arm approach. So lock and glide slope are now blue. There's 3,000 feet, which is working out actually all right. Now the speed is reducing for us, which is good. We're maintaining 1,400 feet per minute, which will get us below the glide slope. So now I can wind that back to about uh, 800 feet per minute. And now we will need to add a little bit of power. There's a localizer, so it's going to turn on to localizer mode. Remember, you need to add power. This is the big thing for this aircraft, is that it'll be very easy to forget that you're in control of the power levers. <laughs> but they are fortunately very responsive. It's gone through slightly. It doesn't seem... That was actually far too big of an intercept, to be fair to it. But it's, it's quite a... <laughs> Airbus would have managed that anyway. That's something I didn't forget. The Dash 8 would not have managed that, so that does make sense, or not, not particularly well. Now let's reduce that vertical speed down to 400 feet per minute, and then we'll intercept the glide slope. We're at 7 miles, or under 6 miles now, so I actually want the speed to be lower than that. I don't know why it's targeting such a high speed. So let's put some flap out, flap 15. Ah, there we go. Now it targets the lower speed. And I say target, it literally just means it displays that next speed down. We are visual. So a little bit off the localizer, but there we go. And we'll go to landing flap. Power at idle. And you'll see here how hard it is to get it back to that actual approach speed. Now I want to approach slightly faster. I said about 115. I think that's a little bit slow. So I'm going to keep the power on just to stay at the top of that bug. Again, I don't know what ATR pilots do. Next landing checklist. Camera crew advised. Landing gear down. We have our three greens flaps. We have them at 30. Power management needs to be reset to takeoff. That'll be in case we go around, which makes sense. So reset to takeoff and it increases the speed of the propellers, funnily enough. Dash 8, we did have an option to leave them running at low speed at that point. TLU low speed is there. Uh, and the icing AOA light, you could turn that on, which would increase the stall, I believe, in the case of icing. Not doing that. External lights as required. Landing lights are on. Taxi takeoff light on. There we go. So as you can see, we've made it now onto the approach. We are configured, gear down, power on, flat full, arriving into Guernsey. What a great little airplane. This has been such fun for me to learn. I really like it. Talk of about 19%, probably a bit low. I'm trying to keep it up, I say 115. Normal for turboprops to arrive with sort of a, a flat deck attitude, as it were. Jets come in with a nose high attitude, as you know. Maybe a little bit fast. Bring it back down again. Good. Remember, all manual power. You must remember that yourself. <laughs> so to land, it does float a little bit. So I'm going to um, try and just get it down into the numbers. It's a short runway here. I've given myself a bit of a challenge. So when I disconnect the autopilot, I just carry on flying down. Not too much correction. It's all manual trim, of course, when the autopilot is out. And then we're going to... I am going to idle it. The dash 8 I wouldn't put into flight idle generally until the main wheels were down, but in this aircraft I think it does seem to work in this sim anyway. One thing to note is it doesn't quite register that you've gone from flight idle to ground idle, so you might need to give it a bit of a nudge um, to make sure that works out. So there we go, 115. We can start coming back towards our approach speed. Autopilot off. Approaching minimum. It's reading out our minimums for us. And it does read out the radar as we come into land as well. No, no auto brake, so I will be using reverse on this one for the short runway. Power back to idle. There's down, match reverse, keeping it straight with the rudder. Now, that's probably not quite the right technique, but there we go. Didn't even need the brakes on that one. The reverse, very powerful. We'll go back to forward idle or ground idle. And now you can hear those propellers spooling down to their ground idle position. And there we go. Welcome to Guernsey. Just lovely.
So that's all for today's video. Th thank you so much for watching. I have really, really enjoyed bringing this aircraft to you today. I think it's actually really quite good. The ATR is a very unique airplane and a very interesting airplane, as I said at the start. And for me, it's been a particular insight into the competitor to the aircraft that I flew, the Q400, and also the Air Airbus that I fly. Uh, every day it's really nice to to get it to see it um, in this perspective it does feel in many ways like a, a combination of the two it's advanced and the systems are modeled here nicely they do seem to be interacting if you are an absolute atr aficionado and you know everything about it then maybe this aircraft won't have everything i'm not knowledgeable enough on the atr to know but i am finding as an airline pilot it's giving me enough to get thinking about with the hydraulics the brakes the auto feather systems the transformer rectifiers all of these things working the propeller brake big fan of that great fun i think visually the model is very nice like i say very clean so could do with some grime perhaps coming out of the engine exhaust and so on but otherwise the, the decals are clear it's crisp and it looks nice in the sun as you can see and the lighting system is very nice as well that the lights will come out at the right angles i, I think it's uh, very nice it's fun as well to get the latest version of this aircraft because it is a, a, quite a modern machine really as we can see from the integrated checklist system which is all functioning which I've been very pleased with as well. I think it's going to open up a lot of exciting routes for us and I'm definitely looking forward to streaming it on the channel. I did buy this with my own money so this is not um, not an endorsement or anything like that. It is entirely from my own money at, uh, or the channel um, and your support that we buy these aircraft so it has uh, been good to, to get um, a nice taste of it at the release version and see what we think there'll be plenty more videos guides live streams coming on the channel including now flights with the atr so do please subscribe if you'd like to see more my podcast is also still continuing from flight level 320 is the name of my podcast it's on uh, spotify and also you'll find the videos on my youtube channel that's all then thank you so much for watching we'll see you again in another video live stream or podcast so do please keep safe and well bye bye